Hello and welcome to the Hanseatic League, a podcast from the History of the Germans Network. Episode 4, Grain and Beer. And maybe some fish. This week we'll kick off with a string of cities along the Baltic coast from Lübeck up to Königsberg, modern day Kaliningrad. Who founded them? And why? And why so many? And who were the people who came to live there? How did they organize themselves? And most importantly, what did they produce and what did they trade? We'll dwell on the most splendid of those, Gdansk or Danzig in German, the one city in the Baltic that could give Lübeck a run for its money. A place that developed as six separate cities and only became one entity in the late 15th century. And as we talk about Gdansk, we'll also talk about the Vistula River, Europe's ninth longest, that connected Gdansk not just to many of Poland's great cities, but also to the agricultural wealth of the Prussia of the Teutonic Knights, to the Ukraine and to ancient Lithuania. And all that food stuff is put on ships and goes to the growing cities of Flanders, the Rhineland, England, northern France and even Spain. For the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire do we hear about large-scale grain shipments that sustain urban centers, urban centers that couldn't otherwise exist. But grain was not the only thing the Hansa became famous for. The other is Germany's most popular drink and best-known export, beer. The economics there are even more fascinating. Since people did not only drink vast quantities of beer in the Middle Ages, they also cared a lot about where it came from. And Einbecker was Europe's favorite beer. If you were hoping to finally hear about the Hanseatic contour in Bergen, well, let's see how far we get. But before we start, let me tell you that all podcasts within the History of the Germans podcast network are advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. You'll find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Matt B, Tim KJ, Simon K and Ben and Jim E who've already signed up. As you know, I sometimes do feature other podcasts I like on the history of the Germans. Podcasts I believe you may like too. So today I want to point you to the History of the Second World War podcast. And here's Wesley himself telling you all about it. Hello everyone, my name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. I hope you will join me on this journey through the most cataclysmic conflict in human history, as we try and answer not just the questions of what and where, but why and how. Join me on a journey around the globe as we broaden the scope of Second World War history beyond the well-known battlefields of Europe and the Pacific. During weekly episodes, I seek to provide new insight for longtime students of the war, while also being a great jumping on point for anyone seeking deeper understanding of World War II. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Last week, we talked about the largest European fisheries in the pre modern period, the herring market in Skane. Millions of herring travelled every year between July and September through the narrow Öresund. The fish were caught and then salted in barrels. The salt for that came in part from Germany, namely from Lüneburg, Oldesloe and Halle an der Saale, and was brought in by the merchants of Lübeck. The other half of the salt had come from the Bay of Bourneuf on the French Atlantic coast, initially brought in by Dutch, Flemish and English merchants, but over time that trade too was usurped by Hanseatic merchants. Our budding merchant empire has now gained a quasi-monopoly on herring, has gained access to the main supply of beeswax and furs and got busy exploiting the mineral wealth of Sweden. But that is not all. There is another major set of products that came in via the southern shore of the Baltic through the line of cities that stretches like a string of pearls along the coast. Now, Since this is a podcast about the Hanseatic League, it would be great if I could name you all the cities along that coast that were members of the League. But I can't. The Hanseatic League did not run a register of members. Membership shifted constantly. Only Lübeck was there from the start to the finish. 
but even places that are seen as thoroughly Hanseatic today, like Bremen, had initially been reluctant to join and were expelled at some point, or both. Tradition has it that there were 72 permanent members and about 130 floating members. But there is not even a definitive list of these 72. It's like that 72 was a purely symbolic number, made up as 7 times 12, each an important number in numerology. And even if there had been 72 confirmed members, there is no way I can talk about all of these. My choice, which once I mention, is entirely subjective, driven by what I think is important or entertaining. And if that means I miss one or other proud Hanseatic city in this podcast, my apologies. Now, the ones we're talking about today are Wismar, Rostock, Stralsund, Greifswald, Stettin, Szczecin in Polish, Kolberg, Kolobrecht in Polish, Danzig, Gdansk, Elbling, Elblag, and Königsberg, Kaliningrad, as well as the inland cities of Krakow and Einbeck. So, let's go from west to east. The first cities we should have a look at are Rostock and Wismar. Rostock was the first to be founded in 1218, that's more than 60 years after Lübeck and 17 years after Riga. Wismar came a few years later in 1226. Now these dates refer to the date when these places received city rights, not when they were first occupied. So very much like Lübeck itself, these places had been villages or townships long before. Their population had largely been of Slavic descent and there were also often still pagans. We did talk about the history of the Slavic peoples living between the Elbe and the Oder rivers at length in the episodes 95 to 108 of the History of the Germans podcast. So this constellation should not come as a surprise. These new foundations were explicitly meant for German Christian merchants who, in the case of Rostock and Wismar, mostly came from Lübeck and whose roots go back to Westphalia, the Rhineland and Flanders. They were given an area adjacent but separate from the existing Slavic township or village, and only the settlement of the Germans would be given the town laws that granted them the right to establish a city council and exercise lower jurisdiction. They would then build a wall around their new city. In some cases, like in Rostock, the first city is almost immediately followed by a second one right next to it. One ends up being called the Altstadt, or Old City, and the other Neustadt, or New City, even if the new city is barely a decade younger than the old one. Each would have their own city council, their own town hall, and their own city wall. In Rostock, there was also the seat of the Princes of Mecklenburg, which formed the technically fourth entity. These four settlements merged into one city in 1265, chose one city council for the whole, and built a joint city wall surrounding the agglomeration. Okay, that was the process, but it still does not explain why the Princes of Mecklenburg wanted these cities to be created and why they wanted them filled with German merchants. As so often in history, it was the two main drivers of human behavior, greed and fear. The princes on the Baltic shore, be they the Counts of Holstein, the Mecklenburger or Pomeranians, as well as the princes further inland, the Markgrafs of Brandenburg and Meissen, the Duke of the Shrunken Saxony, the House of Wealth, the Archbishop of Bremen, the Bishop of Magdeburg, and all these other ones lived in constant fear. None could be certain of their position. The central authority in the form of the Emperor Frederick II had returned home to Sicily, leaving the Regnum Teutonicum in the hands of his infant son and a regency council with the strict instruction not to exercise too much authority. And by 1250 even that bit of central control had fallen away entirely, leaving an almost free-for-all held together by some loose rules of chivalric behaviour. For a prince, count, duke or bishop to feel secure, he needed fortresses and money. Lots of money. A city surrounded by a wall is a formidable defensive position, and what is even better is that the cost of building and maintaining this fortress is borne by the city inhabitants. Plus, cities were great engines of the economy. The city's artisans create goods, people desire, and tools that increase productivity. The merchants open up markets, bringing and sending out goods. The city itself becomes a market for the agricultural surplus generated on the farms nearby, and all that activity could be turned into sources of tax income for the princes. With a solid set of defences and some tidy income from taxes and tolls, a prince could then get on with the long and arduous task of turning his hodgepodge of rights and privileges into a territorial state. 
and that was expensive. It required buying up lands and rights from other lords, knights and bishops, and when they were hard to convince, take it away from them by force, until all the power in the territory is consolidated in one hand. But, as we all know, there is no such thing as a free lunch, and not even for a medieval prince, who can raid any of his serfs' homes and demand food. The price he had to pay was to grant the new settlers a number of freedoms. In particular, the right to form their own city council, to administrate their affairs and to adjudicate at least their civil disagreements and petty crimes. Only the judgment over serious crimes, in particular the right to convict someone to death, was reserved to the prince. That is what it took to convince a merchant from Lübeck, Dortmund, Visby or Riga to move to Wismar or Rostock. So confusingly, the political project aimed at consolidating all power in the hands of the princes starts with the princes giving some of these powers away to immigrants. And they will live to regret that decision. Hearing that the princes of Mecklenburg set up trading cities exclusively for German merchants on their lands may sound a bit bewildering to some of you. Because you may remember that the princes of Mecklenburg were descendants of Niklond, that pagan Slavic leader who had fought and lost against Henry the Lion. And this was the last leg of a set of wars and harassments that goes back to the 10th century. There could not have been much love lost between Slavs and Germans. The ethnic persecution of Slavs ended when the first prince, Pribislav, had become Christian and was recognized as a magnate in the Holy Roman Empire, first by Henry the Lion and then by the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. So just 60 years before the founding of Rostock, Mecklenburger and Saxons had been caught in a brutal struggle for survival and now the Slavs are inviting the Germans in, giving them lands and privileges. Now if these Slavic princes did care about their own people being pushed aside and over time letting their lands turn into German speaking, there is little evidence of it. Fortification and income were apparently more important. And we are still 500 years before the invention of nationalism, making identities as Christian and as an aristocrat much more important than the ethnic relationships. And this policy of inviting German merchants to settle in their lands was not limited to the Mecklenburgers. The next set of cities along the Baltic coast are Stralsund, Greifswald, Stettin, Szczecin in Polish, and Kolberg, Kolobzek in Polish. The magnates who founded them were the princes of Rügen and the dukes of Pomerania. These two were of Slavic extraction. The princes of Rügen had been amongst the most committed pagans and guardians of the last great pagan temple at Cap Arcona. Likewise, the dukes of Pomerania had originally been the leaders of the Slavic tribe of the Pomeranians, who had taken up Christianity thanks to the silver-tongued preaching of Bishop Otto von Bamberg and the steel-tipped lances of Duke Boleslav III of Poland. And again, these princes invited German settlers to come to their lands, take over some of the most promising trading locations, and build their cities. In the case of Stettin, Szczecin, the choice was particularly stark, since it had been a sizable city since at least the 10th century, with an established trading activity. Still, the Duke of Pomerania decided in 1237 to give the combined entity a German city law, replacing the existing Slavic rules. And these princes did it for very much the same reasons as their neighbours to the west. The powers they had to contend with were the Danes, the Markgrafs of Brandenburg and Poland. But the Danes under Waldemar II had raided along the Baltic shores for decades before the Battle of Bornhoved, leading to serious depopulation of the territory. Meanwhile, the ambitious Markgrafs of Brandenburg had been expanding both northwards and eastwards. Brandenburg's move east was facilitated by Poland breaking up into six duchies after the death of Boleslav III Rymouth. None of these duchies could dominate the other, though technically the duke who resided in Krakow was the overlord of the whole of Poland. Each of them were in a precarious position vis-à-vis -vis their cousins, vis-à-vis -vis the Markgrafs of Brandenburg, but not only them. What knocked Poland truly for sex in this period was the Mongol invasion. In 1241 they arrived, led by Batu, the grandson of Genghis Khan. The Duke of the Polish Duchy of Malopolska, a nominal leader of the whole, went to face them at Chmielnik. His forces were annihilated and the Duke fled south. His cousin, Henry the Pious, Duke of Silesia, fared no better. He had gathered even more troops and was defeated at Lignica, and he himself was torn to pieces. <laughs> 
though the Mongols turned back, either because the election of a new Khan was taking place or because they found the climate less hospitable for their specific needs, they did briefly stop to completely wipe out the populations of Krakow, Lublin, Sandomierz and many other cities. So, for these reasons, the Polish and the Pomeranian dukes needed to repopulate their cities as defensive positions and as sources of cash. And that meant inviting foreigners to come and settle down. And these foreigners were mostly from the Holy Roman Empire and, as we said before, demanded that they should have some say in the way their new cities were administrated and managed. This meant that cities were either given the law of the city of Lübeck if they were along the coast or the law of the city of Magdeburg if they were more inland. That resulted in a situation where places like, for instance, Krakow consisted in a ducal castle complex plus a Polish settlement around it which was inhabited by Poles and subject to traditional Polish laws and ducal jurisdiction. And meanwhile, an entirely new city had been founded right next to it, which was largely inhabited by German immigrants, who had their own laws, jurisdictions, customs and language. In some cases, these different settlements merged into one large city with a common city council. In other cases, the different administrative structures and ethnic segregations remained for centuries. And when these cities, like Krakow, joined the Hanseatic League, it was usually just a German merchant settlement that did so. Which gets me to the bit of today's show that will get me by far the largest number of complaints and social media hate mail. And that is the story of the greatest of all of these cities along the Baltic shore. Danzig as the Germans call it, or Gdansk as it's called in Polish. The history of Danzig slash Gdansk could easily take up a whole episode and I may still do it at a later stage. But for today, I will stick to the bare bones. Gdansk may well be the oldest of the Hanseatic cities. Archaeologists have found remains of an 8th century Slavic settlement underneath the long market in the center of the city. Arab visitors in the 10th century mention it, and Adalbert of Prague, the saintly friend of Emperor Otto III, set off for the land of the Prutzi and his utterly predictable death from here. In the 13th century, Gdansk became the seat of a local prince the Duke of Pomerania, not Pomerania, another one of these Slavic rulers who got baptized and then elevated to a feudal rank of duke. The Duke of Pomerania were vassals of the kings of Poland and not princes of the Holy Roman Empire. The eastern border of the Holy Roman Empire was the Duchy of Pomerania. All lands east of there, including Pomerania, Gdansk and Prussia, never became part of the Holy Roman Empire even though there were later parts of the Kingdom of Prussia and the German Reich between 1871 and 1918, and some of it until 1945. As I said, German history is complicated. Back to the medieval Dukes of Pomerania. They supported the growth of their settlement at Gdansk, and as it expanded, a new part of town was created to house more artisans and Slavic merchants. This part was called the Suburbium, or the Suburb. From the end of the 12th century, German merchants in particular from Lübeck came to Gdansk and the Duke gave them their own district to settle down in. This district also grew rapidly and in 1225 Duke Svetoplok of Danzig granted the German settlers city rights. These applied only to their settlement, which became known as the Rechtsstadt, or City of Rights, as only this settlement had city rights, whilst the old castle area and the suburb did not. By the end of the 13th century, the Rechtsstadt, so just a German merchant city, not the other bits, joined the Hanseatic League. In 1294, the Dukes of Pomerelia died out. The region was then fought over by the Markgrafs of Brandenburg, some of the Polish Dukes and the Teutonic Knights, a war the Teutonic Knights did win. The Teutonic Knights took over the old ducal castle. They did not like their cities to be too independent though, and they had their own ports and trading cities which meant they tried to suppress the Rechtsstadt. At the same time, they founded another Slavic settlement mainly for fishermen and the collectors of amber. This settlement they called the Hakelberg. So now we have four different cities on the territory of modern Gdansk. Three Slavic ones, the castle, the suburb and the Hakelberg, and one German one, the Rechtsstadt. The Teutonic Knights' efforts to keep the burghers of the Rechtsstadt down turned out to be unsuccessful. The settlement grew and grew and immigrants arrived almost continuously from the empire, 
looking for opportunities to make a fortune in this booming trading city. The Rechtsstadt quickly became too small and so another city was founded, the Neustadt or Newtown. And even that was not enough, so another, a sixth city was founded, the Jungstadt, the Young Town. Meanwhile, the old suburbia, that used to be the place where the Slavic artisans and merchants had lived, was gradually taken over by German immigrants, so that this settlement too was given German city laws in 1377 and was renamed Old Town. There we are. The end of the 14th century, the place we know today as Gdansk or Danzig, consisted of no less than six separate political entities, all with different legal and political frameworks, their own councils, town halls and city walls. Four of those were dominated by German merchants and artisans, the Rechtsstadt, Neustadt, Jungstadt and Altstadt, whilst the Hakelwerk was mainly populated by Pomeranian fishermen and the castle area by the Teutonic Knights, their administrators and servants, as well as some Pomeranians. Only in the 15th century, once Poland had again taken control of Gdansk, would this agglomeration be unified under one city council. We'll get back to Gdansk in a minute, but let me just complete the round of the Baltic coast. So if you go further east along the coast from Pomerelia, you get to the territory of the Teutonic Knights. As you know, we'll do a whole series about the Teutonic Knights, so we'll touch upon their story only briefly here. The Teutonic Knights had been called in by the Duke of Mazovia, that was one of these six Polish dukes, and they were asked to force the pagan Prutzi into submission and acceptance of Christianity. The Teutonic Knights did stick to that part of the brief and conquered the land of the Prutzi in a 50-year-long brutal fight that led to the near extinction of its indigenous population and converted the remaining peoples to Christianity. And they also established their own autonomous state, reporting to no one. When they turned their mind to rebuilding the wasteland they had created, the Teutonic Knights established their own trading cities, namely Torn, Torun in Polish, Kulm, Kalno, and Elbing, Elblak, and Königsberg, which is now in Russia, called Kaliningrad. The Teutonic Knights did pursue the same objectives in founding these cities as their princely neighbors had. The difference was that they were a lot more successful. All the cities we talked about here would shake off much of the control mechanisms their founders had put in. They would acquire full control of jurisdiction. They would buy off or fight off the taxation rates of their city lords and even gain the right to pursue wrongdoers in the surrounding lands to bring them to court in the cities. Though only very few of the Hanseatic cities became free imperial cities, Lübeck, Bremen, Cologne being the notable cases, the rest were almost as independent of their overlords, even if they had not had that status. The cities in the lands of the Teutonic Knights were different. Their city law, the Kulmer Handfeste, left far more rights in the hands of the knights than the Lübeck law applied in most other cities. The control of the Grand Master was so comprehensive that many negotiating partners of the Hansa considered him to be the member of the Hansa himself, not the cities. So, I'm sorry for this long and arduous run through the foundation story of the various cities along the Baltic coast. The reason I did that was not just to complete the circuit. There is a point to that. And that point is that there is a conflict built into the Hanseatic League right from the beginning. The dukes and princes who remained nominally in charge of these cities may have been forced to accept their independence, but for how long? As the princes consolidate their power and form more modern states, these independent cities start to look like anachronistic leftovers from feudal days, let alone that these places are both militarily and economically crucial to their territories. So defending city liberties against the princes will be a constant undercurrent of the history of the Hanseatic League and one of the reasons for its ultimate dissolution. Which gets us to the next question, what did these cities trade in, and how did they get a foothold in the lucrative Hanseatic trade? Now, we know that Lübeck used the salt from Lüneburg, Oldesloe and Halle to get going. But these other cities along the Baltic coast, they had no salt they could leverage into access to either Novgorod or the herring trade in Skane. In terms of unique natural riches, there was the amber found on the coast of Prussia, a luxury product the Teutonic Knights shipped across Europe. That was, by the way, a truly ancient trade. Pliny the Elder, always a most reliable source, talks about amber from the island he calls Abelus, which is apparently a day's sail from the land of the Teutones, 
wherever all that was. But amber is not really a crucial ingredient in anything. Nothing that can be used to force kings and merchants to let you in to play in the big league. What these cities did have, though, was an enormous hinterland. And in this hinterland, another army of German immigrants had been called in to develop its agricultural production. We talked about the 12th and 13th century colonization of the lands between Elbe and Oder many times in the last season. We are now in the second wave, when colonists move beyond the Oder River, sometimes along with the expansion of the Margraviate of Brandenburg, or to populate the lands of the Teutonic Knights, but also upon invitation of the Slavic Dukes of Mecklenburg and Pomerania, and the Polish Dukes, in particular the Duke of Silesia. The men and women from the first wave who settled into Holstein, Brandenburg and Meissen had come from the overpopulated regions of the Holy Roman Empire, mainly from Flanders and the Rhineland. The settlers into Mecklenburg, Pomerania and Poland had a slightly different background. They were the descendants, the second sons and daughters of the first wave settlers who had come to Brandenburg or Meissen. They did not require much persuasion to replicate what their parents or grandparents had done, having seen how well it had worked. And those who headed for Prussia were again different. They came directly from Franconia and central Germany, where the Teutonic Order had large possessions and many of its members had originated. Their houses in Marburg and Bad Mergentheim kept recruiting settlers, offering land and low taxes. What made the second wave work even better than the first one was that it happened alongside the foundation of the new trading cities we just talked about. These trading cities provided a ready market for the new agricultural production capacity. In part, the grain, meat and fruit produced in the new villages went to feed the population of the new cities, but a large chunk of it also went into export. Grain from Eastern Europe fed the rapidly expanding cities of Flanders, the English ports and in particular that emerging behemoth of London, the cities of the Rhineland with Cologne at its head, northern France and as far as Spain and many more. That list tells you that even assuming the lands of Mecklenburg, Brandenburg and Pomerania were extremely fertile, which they sadly are not, there is no way they could have produced enough to cover that level of demand. Where the produce came from was initially the enormous estates of the Teutonic Knights. We understand that in the year 1400 the various silos of Prussia held 800 tons of wheat, 1500 tons of barley, 6,500 tons of oats and 15,000 tons of rye. 330 ships a year brought grain to England, 1,100 sailed to Flanders alone. The greatest of these export harbours was Gdansk or Danzig. What gave the city a huge advantage was its river, the Vistula. Again, take out an atlas and have a look. The Vistula is the ninth longest river in Europe, flowing all the way from the Carpathian Mountains via Krakow and Warsaw to Gdansk. And it has a number of tributaries, one of which is the Bug, which comes down to Warsaw from Lviv in Ukraine. With this connection, Gdansk became the gateway for the agricultural wealth of Prussia, Ukraine and Poland into Northern Europe. And I guess by now we are all painfully aware of the importance of Ukrainian agriculture in feeding the world. For the first time since ancient Rome, do we hear of large-scale grain transports feeding densely populated centers in Europe. I know, I keep going on about this stuff, but again, grain is a commodity, meaning you carry a lot of weight for not much cash. And you do this over thousands of miles. Getting this done organizationally and economically is no mean feat, and a huge nail in the coffin of the idea that people in the Middle Ages lived within just a tiny radius around their villages. Yes, Many did, but if you were intrepid, you could sail the world even then. Apart from grain, there was the trade in wood. The enormous forests of Prussia, Poland and Lithuania provided the materials to build the cocks of the Hanseatic League, as well as the English and French vessels that fought the Hundred Years' War. Another byproduct was wood ash that could be used as an abrasive cleaner, something the Flemish weavers used in cloth production. And there were the metals found in Hungary, Poland and Bohemia coming down the Vistula and some furs and beeswax from Lithuania. But the biggest export alongside grain was beer. Beer is not something that requires a special climate like wine or a particular water quality like whiskey. Anyone can make it anywhere, 
and they have done so for centuries. Still, the Hanseatic cities became famous across Europe for their beer. Bremen and Hamburg still carry on making beer and brand names like Bex and Holsten tell of the old tradition. Beer accounted for an estimated 8% of the daily calorie intake in the Middle Ages. It is, by the way, a myth that people drank beer instead of water because they were worried about hygiene. If it was at all an issue, it was at best a side issue. It's more that medieval beer was just extremely calorific and relatively low in alcohol, so it was a major source of energy for people who still mainly worked in manual labor. What also set beer apart was that brewing wasn't regulated, in the same way most other trades were. Many medieval trades were organized in guilds that limited access to the profession in the interest of quality control and financial well-being of the incumbents, and that constrained production and hampered economic growth. Making beer wasn't seen as a profession. Originally, most households made their own beer, something you can still do with a beer-making kit. Not everyone can make shoes, bake, butcher or forge a sword. Since there were no guilds, the way the cities tried to control the production and to maintain standards of health and safety was by restricting the number of houses that were allowed to make beer. Hamburg, for instance, had 500 houses where the making of beer was allowed. If someone wanted to become a brewer, he did not have to marry some brewer's widow, schmooze the guild masters and pass an examination. What he or she needed to do was buying one of the houses where brewing was allowed. That's why you often find breweries in Germany being called Brauhaus, meaning brewer's house, referring to the physical location where brewing was allowed. Now we'll go into a completely weird tangent. So forward 45 seconds if you do not want to hear that. One of the largest brands of beer in Brazil is called Brahma. It was founded in 1888 by a Swiss guy called Josef Willinger, together with two Brazilians carrying typical Brazilian names like Paul Fritz and Ludwig Mack. Today, the company is owned by AB Imbef, parent company of Anheuser Busch. In 2020, Brahma found itself under attack by various faith groups, in particular Hindus, for the use of the name Brahma which is, after all, the name of the lord of creation in Hinduism. The company responded by arguing that its beer brand was named after Josef Brahma, an English inventor of the draft pump valve, as well as the flush toilet. That was ridiculed by many, in part because there isn't the slightest bit of evidence, the spelling is different, and also because the beer pump Josef Brahma invented was the kind that is still in use in British pubs. And that is no use for pumping Pilsner, the kind of beer Brahma mainly produces. Had the guys at Anheuserbusch, her own Brahma, known a few words of the German of their forefathers, they would have come up with a much smarter made-up story. They could have claimed that Brahma stands for Brauhaus Mannheim or Brauhaus Mack. Not that there's any evidence for that either, but at least it sounds plausible and relates to an urban myth circulating amongst the German diaspora in Sao Paulo in the 1980s. Okay, back to the Hanseatic League, Brauhaus Brewing. So, as I said, there were no brewers' guilds. But that does not mean that there weren't quality controls. Au contraire, the city council would often issue detailed beer regulations and qualifications for brewmasters and their assistants. These regulations are much older than the famous Reinheitsgebot, which was passed in Bavaria in 1516 and adopted international law in 1906. Hanseatic beer allowed for more variety, but had one major ingredient, hops. Hops altered beer in two ways. One, it made it much easier to preserve, and second, it also gave the beer that hoppy taste that is still a key feature of northern German beer. So far, so good. Hanseatic beer is produced in vast quantities and can be preserved better than the moonshine people made at home, and it tastes nicely hoppy. But why would you export it? I mean, even today, despite global brands, beer is typically consumed within a modest radius from the brewery. And in the Middle Ages, transport costs were much, much higher than today. So transporting beer 100 kilometers overland would increase the cost by, say, 50 to 70 percent, according to Erich Plümer. Now, let me tell you about the great Hanseatic beer city of Einbeck. Einbeck is a smallish town in Lower Saxony, halfway between Hanover and Kassel and has always been a smallish town. The nearest port is Hamburg, 230 kilometers away, and Lübeck, 290 kilometers away. 
So that means by the time Einbeck beer gets to an exporting harbor, it is already more than twice as expensive as the local beer. Now let me tell you that Einbecker beer was famous across northern Europe and was drunk as far north as Bergen and Stockholm, which is another 900 kilometers onwards by boat. Why would people pay 5x for the imported version of a daily staple? Something they drank more than 200 liters each per year. Well, for the same reason one has to pay through the nose for champagne, Wagyu beef, Apple phones and Louis Vuitton handbags. It's branding. Somehow German brewers managed to convince their customers across Europe that their beer was a luxury product well worth its exaggerated price. And Einbecker stood at the top of this brand pyramid. Martin Luther was given a barrel of Einbecker to get some Dutch courage before his trial for excommunication and another when he got married. The demand for this Chateau Lafitte of beers kept 700 brew houses in Einbeck busy. Einbecker Bock is still available, produced by the Einbecker Brauhaus, that traces itself back to 1378. Try it and tell me whether you were prepared to pay 5x for that beer. Alongside Einbeck, Hamburg, Bremen and Wismar too were celebrated for their beer. But all the Hanseatic cities were exporting beer, still being able to extract a premium over the local lagers. Right. We are now rapidly approaching our probably gone past the half hour mark. And that will now be the moment where for the third time I will have to say that, sorry, I will not get to Bergen. We will not talk about the Tiskebriggen, the Hanseatic contour. It's becoming a bit of a running joke now, right? But next week I will definitely get there, scouts honor. And I will because now everything is in place. We've gone through all the major trading products that come out of the Baltic. Wax, fur, copper, grain, beer, amber, wood, ash, and the big one, herring. We talked about salt and how Lübeck could leverage it into access to both Novgorod and the herring trade. Now next week we will find out how the league as a whole, but mostly the cities of Prussia and Pomerania, leverage grain and beer into access to dried cod, haddock and hake in Bergen, and privileges in the greatest of all medieval trading markets, in Bruges, in Flanders. I hope... You will join us again. And now before I go, let me explain to you how the show works. You're currently listening to a podcast about the Hanseatic League. All these episodes you get here are also available on the main feed under the History of the Germans podcast. This episode, for instance, is number 112 on the main podcast. So if you enjoy this show and want to hear more, go over to the History of the Germans podcast. We've already covered the Ottonian Empire in episodes 1 to 21, the Investiture Contest in episodes 22 to 42, the reign of Frederick Barbarossa and his immediate predecessors in episodes 43 to 66, the time of the civil wars between the Welf and the Hohenstaufen and the reign of Frederick II in episodes 70 to 94, and the history of the Great Stem Duchy of Saxony in episodes 95 to 108. And as you have heard in the beginning, the history of the Germans and all its offshoots are funded entirely by the generosity of our patrons, so if you feel it is worth supporting this effort, go to patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or to my website historyofthegerman slash support and make either a one-time donation or sign up for a monthly or yearly contribution. If you do the latter, you get access to occasional bonus episodes, but mostly you're supporting the show. And if Patreon isn't for you, you can also support the show by helping raising its profile. The best way to do so is tell friends, family, strangers in the street, simply anyone that you love the show. And you can do that face-to-face -face or on social media. And if you want to link to my content, I'm on Twitter under at Germans History and on Facebook under at HotGPod. All the links are also in the show notes. Last but not least, bibliography. For this episode, I again relied heavily on Philip Dollinger, The Hanse, definitely my go-to book for this season. The other major book, Die Hanse, Lebenswirklichkeit und Mythos, herausgegeben by Jürgen Bracker, Volker Henn and Rainer Postel, was extremely helpful. It contains specific articles on each of the major Hanseatic cities, on brewing, on the way that cities are organized, and many other topics. And there's Rolf Hamel-Kieslow, Die Hanse, which I also find very helpful. <laughs> 